Good. So this recording, if you have any question and you don't want your voice to be recorded, just raise your hand and I'll mute the microphone. So after having seen the topic of attention uh, mechanisms, now we will see some applications to probably one of the most influential architectures nowadays, which is the transform. Acknowledgements to Marta, Gerard, and Carlos Colano from the Machine Translation Group here at UBC. So first, uh, some reminder, or um, just sent, show you here again this uh, this tree that uh, distinguishes different way of classifying uh, attention mechanisms. Before we were we explained the difference between additive or concatenated attention mechanism product. <laughs> One dot product one scale dot product. Now I want you to focus on this other difference, which is on the source of the query and the keys. So okay, this is a reminder of the attention mechanism we saw it earlier, so we'll need to remember it. Oh yeah, sorry, now that I remember. So when we talk about um, cross attention. That's what we have seen until now. Okay, that's when we compute the attention score by comparing tokens from the output with tokens from the cross because the attention is across different sequences. <laughs> now I will introduce uh, self attention. Okay, and the question is: Okay, see if cross is when comparing tokens from different sequences, what should self attention refer to? So that refers to uh, comparison of tokens from the same sequence. Which maybe now it's a bit weird, but you, I try to, to explain why this may make sense. So self-attention. So self-attention, also sometimes called the inter-attention, refers to attending to other elements from the same sequence. For example, there's one uh, in language, there's a very clear example when we have the cases of pronouns. So imagine that we are analyzing this image and we find the token each. So it by itself, without the context, it's a very, very generic token and it's, it's, it's hard to understand what it refers to. But in a context of a, of a sentence, it in particular in this sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, it refers to the animal. So the idea is that we would like, when encoding our input tokens or also output tokens, uh, to encode each of the tokens uh, in a context. That's what the attention mechanism, self-attention mechanism, allow us to do. So re remember that in, in output, uh, sorry, in cross-attention, the tokens of the output, we were predicting them, uh, considering the whole input sequence as, as a context, say, for the predictions. And also, uh, based on the previous tokens at the output, in this case, the tokens of one sequence, it's encoded, it's updated, it's enriched, if you want, with its context. Each context. Here in, in this plot, what you see are the attention scores for this sentence when focusing on each. Let's see another example. Here you have a sentence called John used a bat to hit six. So six is a, um, some event in baseball. So this bat refers to a sports. We'll focus on this token, bat. So what this plot shows is each of these uh, circles refers to one of these tokens, each of these words. We can we could think that we, we're going to have a word embedding for just of these words. A word embedding, remember this, it's a, a dense and short representation of a word that normally it has been pre-trained uh, by a long done and supervised task, like language model, like maybe put it in the next task. So we have one representation for each of the tokens. And here, these three circles that you can see over there, they refer to the query key and value of each of the tokens. So if we focus in bat, 
what we are going to do is we're going to take the key, uh, sorry, the bat as a query, so it's a query key and value, and compare it with all the rest of keys. So that's why it's comparing with the one in the middle. Okay, the one in the middle is the is the key, and some of the lines are thicker than others. They refer that if the line is thicker, means that the the similarity is higher. The attention is high. That the attention score is higher. Uh, notice something that sometimes people forget that bad is also uh, compared to itself. Okay, so we compute the key and query. We also compare it with itself with the same token. So the result of all these uh, attentions, in the end, they correspond to the attention score. That's uh, what we have over there. And these uh, attention scores after, sorry, that's already after the softmax, that will be the weighted values. That's what we use to weight the uh, each of the tokens as values. So remember that the third of the balls refers to the values. So we weight them with the weighted values. We add them together and in the end we build the representation for that in the context of this sentence okay so in the end this will be a let's see and then you can think that it's a, an enriched embedding for the word bad the word bad in this context so for example in this enriched embedding or contextual embedding uh, this Representation will refer very clearly to the sports of baseball. It will not refer to the animals at all because that the context helps in understanding that the bat here is not the animal. It's the, the sports. Sure. Yeah. Remember that in order to um, compare, to compute the attention scores, there are going to be these matrices. WQ, WK, WV, that we are going to learn that these matrices, these projection weights, they are shared across all tokens. Let's look uh, to an example of how to more in more detail. So I'm, I will repeat the same now with another visualization. So I hope that in the end you see that everything's always the same. So in this case, I'm going to encode with sub attention uh, a very short sentence, just a, an, an adjective and a noun. So I want to encode thinking machines, but thinking no, no, not isolated, but next to machines. So in the context of machines, the machines not isolated, but in the context of being thinking. So I would first start by having the word embedding. It means I go to any word embedding, fast text or word to back or whatever, port embedding you want. And I take the one for thinking, the one for machines. And then I compute the queries, keys, and values for thinking and for machines. In order to compute the query, keys, and values, what I'll do is I will uh, project my uh, embeddings through the projection matrices. Okay, so these projection matrices, the result are what I, for each of the Words thinking of machines are what you, what you see over here. Fine. Yeah, I'm going back. So this I'm, I'm doing this problem with the the projection of query keys and values. Good. Now let's focus on um, the attention scores for thinking. So I, I already have the query keys and values. And now in order to compute the attention score, I need to compute the product between the query and the key first of thinking with itself. That's what I have over here. And then the query of thinking with the key of machines. There, there's another value, whatever. Once I have these two attention scores, what's next now? The softmax, right? So now we, sorry, I, I forgot to divide by A because we have this normalization factor that I mentioned, and now the softmax. Then these weights 
are the ones that I'm going to use to multiply with watch. These two, the opposite of the summax, they are used to, to I'm trying to come, to come up with a representation of thinking. I have these outputs of the submax. What should I do now? What should, which which row should I look at? The yeah. question is not clear, probably. Values. The values, yeah. So I have to take this. I take this uh, the output of the submax and I multiply by the value. Okay, as this one is as this value zero as this softmax score is zero to eighty eight, this one zero twelve. You can see that the that the strength of the color is darker P1 than in P2. P2 is almost invisible. Okay, because relatively it doesn't machines is not that important to encode thinking. So I weight the two values and I sum them. And this Z1 that you see here is a contextual representation of thinking when thinking is uh, found next to machines. On the other hand, this Z2 that you see over here will be the opposite, it will be the encoding. It's, it's not, it's not in, so these, these values they refer to thinking, but we could do the same with machines and combine the uh, find the value for Z2 for the contextual representation of machines. Yeah. Now I will explain the same in matrix notation. Okay, sorry, it's, but it's because soon I will put the formula there that it's it's insane that formula I think. But it explains everything that I'm telling you now. So next time you saw the formula, you try to re remember all the steps that I'm going through. Okay, then we have this input sequence. Now, the input sequence is already in, in, in a matrix of embeddings, but never mind, just one row and another row. So I'm using a matrix notation. Now, projecting uh, to, to the projection matrices to compute the key Korean values, you can think that it's a uh, product of matrices through the through the three matrices that we learn. So as a result, we have the key Korean value. Then the, all the process of doing the cross products between the queries and the keys. That's what we have over here. These are all the all the products. Then we normalize. Then that goes to the softmax. The output uh, is used to weight the values. That's this part. And as a result, I obtain a matrix of embedded of, of contextual embeddings and rich embeddings. Okay. So that's what we have. What I have. All this process, normally in the papers or in the original paper, it was described with this scheme. Okay, when you see when you see this scheme, that's a scale dot product attention, it refers to all this process that we went through. Right? Okay, I'm introducing here uh, one example. So that you see a study case of self-attention, but now I'm moving out of language and I'm going into images because self-attention has also have an important impact in computer vision. So in, in general, there, there was a, a moment in, in China, I guess, that uh, whatever model you had, you added a self-attention layer and it improved the performance okay, in many applications. That's one of the first ones that I, that I found which is a Sagan uh, from I Good Fellow. Do you remember I Good Fellow? Somebody remembers? He was the first author of, he has different words, but he's especially well known for what? For guns, yeah, right? Okay, so some years later, he published uh, Sagan. Okay, so this SA, do you know, do you have an idea what it refers to? Subvention. Subvention, very well. Okay, so what they did is, um, they have an input image, and then they um, 
took the the uh, consider so had one by one convolutions here. You see one by one convolutions it means that you collapse the image or or, or mm. tensor in a intermediate layer. So you, you compress everything into a single layer. Then you have a query for query layer, a key layer, and a value layer. You have the dot product between the query and the key. This builds an attention map. And then this attention map is uh, multiplies, encodes the, uh, sorry, you multiply the value layer to obtain the attention weights. And finally, uh, these attention weights, you apply them for each, each of these inputs, channels. And in the end, you obtain um, uh, the uh, 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 weighted version of this input, which Later, it's still added in this work. They still added uh, the input layer here on top. Okay, so by doing that, they were able to attend to some parts of the image uh, more than others. In this work, they 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 claim that not is a gun, but they claim that then the generator uh, was able to uh, generate details in better accuracy because it had access to all the input. So remember that if we have a convolution in your network, uh, there is a receptive field, which in general, it would limit the, the portion of the image that each convolution neuron sees. And by applying an attention layer, you kind of allow each neuron to be able to attend to any part of the input. So that's why, why for the generator, they argue that that was better for the generator. And they also argue that, that for the discriminator, it was helping the task of the discriminator because it uh, could allow the consistency of, of the generated images across the image, not only in a portion. So here you can see some of the results that they visualize. So for some locations, so remember that now the location you can think they are kind of pixel embeddings. So they compare like the pixel embedding in this part with all the rest and they observed that it was mostly attending to other uh, regions that were similar for the attention map remember that that uh, we can have multiple attention maps in, a, in an image or in a sentence later I will refer to that there was another attention map uh, for this query over here attention map of for this query over here, the, the body. So it was it was kind of um, detecting the most similar parts of the image to the query. So the background for this word again. So this query is moderated to this part, this query is moderated to this part, the head, the legs of the bird for the background. So the query over, over here was mostly focusing on these parts that are also background from the vegetation. Good. So if you enjoyed self-attention, you will multi-enjoy, multi-help self-attention. Okay. So next time you see MHSA, don't get scared. It's something easy. Uh, the concept is, is, I think it's quite easy. So probably you are very aware that, let's say, convolutional networks, in one layer you can have different convolutional filters, and each convolutional filter can capture different patterns. So that's the same thing here. So if we have an attention layer and we have one attention head, that's what, so what we saw now is one attention head. Then that attention head may specialize in attending to certain patterns, but maybe we don't have enough with being able to attend to certain patterns. We want attention heads again uh, deal with different diverse patterns. So what we're going to do is to have multiple attention heads. In terms of slides, uh, what we're going to have is if we have an uh, input feature vectors, that would be a single self-attention block. Um, the output would be the contextual representations of these feature vectors. But if instead of having one, we could have several heads. Okay, each of these rows. In this example, there are four. And what is interesting is that in each of the heads, we're going to have 
different project execution matches this. How different? I mean, we initialize randomly, we let it train, and they will, the same way that convolutional filters, they often learn different patterns, they often learn to recognize different patterns. So matrices will also evolve the training into focusing on different patterns. So now we will not have only one type of contextual vectors. We can have for each token different contextual vectors. If you look at the papers or the paper on the transformer, this uh, multi heads, that's what you see over here, the shaded blocks. That's that's what it means when it refers to multi head. If we go back to our matrix notation, now instead of having one set of projection matrices that produce a set of query keys and values and one set of contextual representations, now we have as many projection matrices, sets of query keys and values as heads. In the example, there are eight, eight heads, zero to seven. Of course, we have multiple contextual embedding representation that complicates things a little bit for later uh, fusion. So what we are going to do is to concatenate all of them. That's what we see over there. Okay, concatenate, we concatenate them, all of these matrices, we concatenate them. And on top, we train a, new, an, an, a linear layer on top of these concatenated matrices so that in the end, we'll have a new uh, contextual representation that not only will uh, be considering the output of one projection uh, matrix, but of uh, n, in this case, eight. Yeah. One example. Uh, in this visualization, it's showing two things. Uh, now it's showing only one head okay, in blue, but when you see multiple colors now, it's uh, showing uh, multiple heads. So, so when you see blue, now you see that how in one head uh, focuses in different words, depending on the token we're looking at. But when you see multiple colors, um, you see the attention of each of the heads for each of the other tokens. Okay, let's keep changing to the front. Now it's single head. Now it's multiple tokens. Yeah, so th this, these are demo. If you can, if you want later, you can, if you click over here, you can really play with the demo yourself. That's for it. Suggest you that. Okay, another concept, positional encoding. Then um, the, atten the attention mechanism compared to the different you know, your networks allows accessing all the input and actually also, also output tokens uh, every time, right? So when we compute the attention, we can access to all the if we are doing cross attention with the input, we are able to access all the input tokens. Then, in this case, um, we no longer need to propagate the hidden state from one time step to another. I mean, we could, the idea of, of recurrent layers, remember when I, when I presented recurrent networks, I said recurrent layers, they allow us to remember what we have seen in the past. Okay, and what the, the, the trick was okay, I have a hidden state, I propagate it to the next time step, and then to the next time step, next time step. And ideally, the theory was that if there was something interesting in the past, by so time step after time step, through the recurrent mechanism, this information would propagate, propagate in the future. That was the theory. With many problems, we had to choose the, that cell memory for LSTMs to so to avoid catastrophic forgetting, so everything was a bit cumbersome. But still, 
Now, with attention mechanisms, I mean, we, we can remember everything we have seen in the past. So we have infinite memory, right? So when, when I, when, when I com compare this, this query with all the keys of the encoder, I mean, there are, I can attend to all these four or any of them. So I, I don't need any, any longer the recurrent, you know, there was an arrow here that I deleted. We don't need it. We don't need this arrow anymore. We need to propagate the hidden state to the next step, right? So if we don't need any longer this recurrency, that's what motivates that the paper that presented the transformer was named, you know, what's the name of the publication that introduced the transformer? Yeah. Somebody? All you need, so attention, attention is, all is all you need. So attention is all, is all you need is the name of that paper. And he was, of that paper, they were mainly, they were saying, hey, you don't need recurrences because with attention, that's, that's all. And that's great because recurrences, they are quite painful to train because, uh, especially when you are, uh, so you, you, need, you need to compute the, the previous output in order before computing the, the next one. So it's the sequential mechanism. While transformers in attention, everything you can just run access the data, everything at the same time. There's no sequentiality in transformers. But uh, if we remove this recurrency, then we, we lose totally notion of, of uh, what is first and what is next. Because actually the recurrency was kind of giving us some some idea of, of of what were the more the more recent tokens because there was an ordering but if you remove the ordering there is there's no notion of order at all so now there's we had a okay we have a recurrency that's great you it will speed up the training it works pretty well but uh we lose this relative relation so what can we do now so what we can do it's to add to our symbol, to our embeddings, we are going to add another embedding. And this embedding will, will, be, will be encoding time, be encoding the relative positions of each token in the sequence. It would yeah, give some hint of where, where in the sequence that is. Okay, so this, these are embed, these encodings that are called positional encodings. And the goal is to help the network to know what, where is the beginning, where is the end, which tokens are nearby, which ones are far away. And that's, it's, a, it's another encoding that you add. You add plus to your contextual embedding. Okay. I know it, for me it's, it's often a little bit unbelievable that, that this still is working, but it, it works, or it works better than other options. Okay, but okay, we can embedding and we add something there and it works. Okay. So what are positional embeddings? Um, so these are encodings, they are based on uh, the original paper, at least they were based on uh, sinusoidals, okay, of different frequency. So you've got different frequencies of signs and you got them all together. For me, that's not very intuitive to understand that I will know where I am in a sequence if you add me at sinusoids, signs. But for me, it's very intuition if somebody tells me, okay, no, it's exactly the same as a watch, right? The watch, they are, they are uh, two hands, they, they are rotating, a sign at different frequencies. And when we combine the two informations, then I know what time in the, in the day I am. Okay, so that's for me, I understand it much better. So that's what the positional encodings are doing with different sinusoids. Not only with two, with whatever, but maybe that's, that's better. That's a better way to understand, okay? And okay, we have all the leading blocks now. We can we arrive to the grand finale. We are reaching the final moment of transformers, which is just put everything we have seen, put it all together, in a single architecture. This is the paper of transformer. This diagram, I think it's really difficult to understand. Hopefully, after this one long hour and a half, it will not be that hard. 
but there's so much information in these diagrams, which seems to be simple, but it's not at all. So now I'm going to go through it in very detail again, and put the connections to what we have seen in the past. So first things you can see here, scale dot product attention. Uh, I introduced you this figure earlier. I introduced the scale dot product. Multi-head attention. I also introduced this figure earlier. And now we're still missing this part, which is the transformer. So that's a paper from 2017, transformer from plus one A, and it's called attention is all unique. So first thing, this small sign that you see over here, that's a positional encoding okay, that I just presented that you add to our embeddings. And there's one for the input sequence and there's another one for the output sequence. Yeah, first idea. Second idea, um, the inputs go there, the outputs go there, but you must see output says shifted right. Okay, which means that again, this is an auto regressive uh, setup. Okay, and when we um, when we encode the the, the output uh, properties, we have access to the previous predictions, and that's the way to be able to access them. To remember what we've predicted in the past. More uh, this. Um, yeah, so you can see this head attention that you see over here on the input tokens. Is that that's attention over the input token? So this one refers to the self attention of the input tokens. This part here. This part over here that's the self attention of the output tokens. That means the output tokens they 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 also have a meaning in in the context. So in in the, in the sequence where they have been predicted. So there's some attention over the output sequence for the output tokens. So, of course, and over the output sequence that we have created so far. So the ones in, in the past. And then this part that crosses, that's a cross attention or inter attention between the input and output tokens. That's the first part that we, that's where I started. Okay, so we have self attention for between the input tokens, self attention over the output tokens, and cross attention between the input and output tokens. What else? Uh, it's not that there's only one layer, there can be many layers. And that's this N here that you see, that means N layers in the encoder. Oops. Oh. And then n layers on the decoder. This n that you see over there. What else? Um, here, just that you again, you understand how big is that. Um, there's a burst bay i burst burst i view of the tension across all the modus layers and and heads. So you can see for one sequence. Uh, again, it's a, it's a demo. You can. Drag yourself, click in there, but you will see the type of visualization, and you can different layers and different heads. This idea of transformer, even if I have been uh, using as a use case most of the time, the translation case, you can apply it, I guess, anywhere. Uh, for example, in computer vision, there has been an important body of work, recent body of work. Trying to apply transformers in the division task. And at some point now, now I'm not really sure if it's true anymore, but at that time, in, okay, one year ago, I guess it was, they presented this in a clear 2021. I guess they published it one year ago or so. Uh, that was state of the art for computer vision when trying to solve the ImageNet task classification. And they did what I mentioned earlier they took the image, they, they created patches. Okay, they uh, train uh, projection of these patches into a smaller vector. They added a position on coding so that the consumer knows which patch goes after the other. And that's it. And they train <laughs> the transformer to solve the classification task of ImageNet in the transformer encoder. And then you predict the classes. Okay, now, now 
the output is only one token, we need the decoder. The decoder, the decoder will predict many tokens. Now, if we only want to do image classification, we don't need the decoder, just need the encoder to be able to attend to the different patches when doing the predictions. Okay. And at that time, that was the state of the art. Now, now there are some new architectures that might work. That's kind of a discussion whether transformer is the best or not. Um, so, okay, it's uh, good, very good performance in accuracy, but that's a lot of, there are many dot products here. So in terms of computation, that's much larger than convolution. So watch out. I mean, I'm saying that if you are doing computer vision, you should jump into this because in terms of computation, it's tough. This paper, I think, I think it's Google. Double check. Yeah, that was Google. So probably somewhere they they mention how many GPUs they use, which you will not have at least for at least for a while. Okay, maybe someday if you probably if you work in Google or whatever, you will have them. Not now, not for your master thesis. Okay. Uh, so extra in two weeks. So extra means that it's coming. In two weeks you have Gerard who will give you this excellent tutorial. So you will go through all these topics again. Don't worry if you miss some parts, you will really implement it in two weeks. But I would really ask you to prepare in two weeks. Just go through the slides again and before there are sessions so that you're already familiar with the topics. So we'll be talking about query squeeze and, and values quite often. If you want to start playing, there's this very nice um, repo called Transformers. Kind Face, which is a great company that people are really enjoying a lot. And there are, I added some other references there. There are plenty of transformers out there. That's a, a core of GPT-3. Talk about self-supervised learning. That was the architecture that they were using. And and that's a talk of the of Baswani in Stanford uh, presenting the transformer in the natural language course they have. Okay. So I encourage you also to watch it. More references, there are millions of them. It's easy to get first. So I will stop the recording now in case somebody wants to ask a question.